Well, a few weeks ago, I mentioned how the Holy Spirit placed John chapter 5 and John chapter 6 back to back, even though they're almost a year apart in terms of time. And this is because both events are very similar in that Jesus performs a miracle in John chapter 5 and also in John chapter 6. And then in both chapters, that miracle gives Jesus an opportunity to more better explain to those who don't know about him who he is. In John chapter 5, it is Christ's healing of the paralyzed man that gives him an audience. And in John chapter 6, it is his feeding of over 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two small fish that gives him an audience. And yet, despite these very clear displays of Christ's supernatural power, a lot of people don't understand what this means about the true identity of Jesus. And this leads to a Q&A session that starts in our text today. Please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 25 through 29 today. John chapter 6, verses 25 through 29. Please stand with me as we read God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and inerrant or without error word. John chapter 6, verses 25 through 29. Let's read it together. <clears throat> and when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. <coughs> the first thing we notice as we look at this text and come to John chapter 6, verse 25, is that when the crowd finally finds Jesus in Capernaum on the other side of the sea, they say to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And this might seem like an innocent question. But compare what the crowd calls Jesus to what the disciples call Jesus after he walked on the water to their boat. How does Rabbi compare with Matthew 14, 33? Let me go ahead and read it. Matthew 14, 33 says, Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. <coughs> now don't misunderstand this. Rabbi is certainly an honorable title. It means a, a teacher, someone with authority, which is something that Jesus definitely is. The disciples also call Jesus Rabbi many times. But just as we saw there in Matthew, the disciples came to recognize that Jesus is much more than just a rabbi. They recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, which means he is God. But does the crowd know this? Do you know this? Look at John chapter 6, verses 26 through 27. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me. Not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Jesus knows that the only thing the crowd is thinking about is the fact that he fed them. 
That's all they're thinking about. Indeed, verse 34 reveals they're hoping Jesus is going to feed us again. Uh, so that way, if, if you feed us again and you keep on feeding us, then that means I can quit work. You know, I, 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 can, I can just uh, uh, get free food from you all the time and be taken care of and I can do whatever I want. I don't have to work anymore. But notice what the crowd's not thinking about. The crowd is not thinking about how is Jesus able to feed us with five loaves of bread and two small fish? They're not thinking about that. I, and I know that might seem amazing. It's like, what? How, how could they not be thinking about that? I'd be thinking about that. How is he able to do that? How is he able to feed so many people with so little? But they're not thinking about it. And they should be. But you know, we can fall into the same trap sometimes, if we're honest. Um, let's say someone starts giving you expensive gifts all the time. And they never did before, but now they started. And you know that it's not like they got a better paying job. They didn't get an inheritance. And so, but they're giving you this expensive stuff and you're, and you're not really sure how they're able to afford it. But after a while, you're like, that's, oh, that's not important. It doesn't matter. What's important is, you keep giving me that nice stuff. You know, that, yeah, that can happen. Until you find out the reason why they were able to give you everything they gave you is because they've been stealing. Then all of a sudden, you wish you knew and it becomes, you realize it was important for me to know, man, I, that's not good. Uh, uh, especially if you have to give the stuff back, you know, because it was stolen. Uh, but, but we can fall into that same trap. Sometimes we can become so uh, enamored with, with what we're getting, we're not even thinking about how it came to be. And that's what's going on here. But the crowd's not thinking about how Jesus is able to feed more than 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two small fish. But they're not thinking about how Jesus is able to do it. They're just thinking about, can you keep doing it so I don't have to work anymore? Uh, and how do we know the crowd's thinking that? Because it's not just because of verses 26 and 34. It's also because of verse 27, where Jesus starts talking about labor or work. Now, don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. He's, he's not saying that you shouldn't work to buy food. He's not saying that. Because even before sin entered the picture, Adam worked. Adam worked. He tended the garden. He kept it. True, there were no thorns or thistles back then. Uh, uh, work wasn't uh, tedious as it is now because of sin. But the fruit still had to be harvested. Uh, and so work existed before sin... Uh, but before sin, it was always fulfilling. It was never, didn't have all the bad stuff that it has associated with it now. But, but work is a good thing. It's the reason why we celebrated Labor Day a few weeks ago. Work is a blessing at its best. However, working for food or working to provide for you and your family isn't all there is to life. That's what Jesus is getting at here. Life is more than just work. It's about more than just food. That's what Jesus is getting at in John 6, 27, when he says, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Now this has echoes of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, which is something that even Jesus quotes in the New Testament when the devil tempted him in the wilderness he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But more than that, John 6, 27 points to verse 35, which we won't get to today, but Lord willing, we'll get to next week. But in John 6, 35, we read, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst ever think about how much your life revolves around food? How much, a lot. how much of your life revolves around work? Man, it's a lot. It's like, 
you, you eat multiple times a day, every day. And, and, and your stomach lets you know if you forget. Mine definitely does. And then there's work. Even as a little kid, you start going to school. Why? So you can get ready to go to work someday. And, and everything from preschool to your senior year of high school is teaching you about things you're going to need for work. And then after high school, some go on to get more schooling in order to get a specific job. But whenever your schooling ends, you go to work. And, and you put in all those years of work at school just to go to work for an even longer time later. And you keep on working until your life is nearly over. Now, if life was just about work and food, all the stuff I just said would be very depressing. It really would be. But there's so much more to life than just work. So much more to life than just food. In fact, the most important thing in life is Christ and his word. Why is that? Well, because while you labor your whole life for food which perishes, digging into and believing the word of Christ is a food that results in everlasting life. In a world cursed by sin, everything dies. Everything. But Jesus, the Son of God, who became a Son of Man, has the power to give you and everyone else who trusts in him the gift of everlasting life. And we know that Jesus is able to give you and I this gift because of his death and because of his resurrection. His tomb is empty. Nobody else's is. He, he got up and walked out of there. But let's put ourselves back in the shoes of this crowd here in John chapter 6. Jesus hasn't died on the cross yet. He hasn't risen from the dead yet. So how can these people know that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, look at the end of verse 27. I've read it now a couple more a couple times already, but let me read it one more time. At the end of verse 27, it says, It's because God the Father has set his seal on him. What's that talking about? Well, all the way back in John chapter 1, verses 32 through 34, John the Baptist started testifying. He started sharing with other people how he saw the Holy Spirit descend and remain upon Jesus after Jesus got baptized. And this convinced John the Baptist that Jesus really is the Son of God. And John maintained this all the way up through his death prior to the start of John chapter 6. Now, obviously, people didn't have to believe in John the Baptist's testimony, nor John the son of Zebedee or anybody else's. But God the Father has also shown his seal of approval and his seal of authenticity upon Jesus through another way, through the miracles that Jesus is able to perform. And these included not just the feeding of the 5,000, but the countless healings, uh, even his ability to raise people from the dead. The point is, this seal, this sign of Jesus Christ's authority and his sign of really being the Son of God, we see it because Jesus, even though he hasn't died and rose again yet, he could not be able to do the things that he does without being the Son of God. He has to be the Son of God to be able to do what he does. And so it shouldn't be surprising to anyone, even here in John chapter 6, that Jesus has the power to give everlasting life. He really does. He can give it to you and me, all of us. We just have to repent of our sins and trust in him. And yet questions remain. Perhaps questions remain in your own life. You're just not sure. We see that here in John 6, 28. It's okay to have questions. There's nothing wrong with having questions. What's wrong is not seeking the answers. In John 6, 28, we read the crowd say, Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of 
of God. We read that and we see, man, the crowd's just not tracking. They're not following what Jesus is saying. They're, they're kind of lost. Uh, they heard him talking about work and they heard him talking about everlasting life. But that makes them wonder, what work do we have to do to earn everlasting life? And that's what a lot of people think. They think, well, i got to do something. i got to go to church and check that box and go to Sunday school and check that box. Or i got to volunteer and check that box. So many people think that salvation, getting to heaven, is about just checking boxes, doing certain works. And that's what the crowd's thinking here. This is a, a common misunderstanding. They heard Jesus talking about work and everlasting life, and that makes them wonder what work they have to do to earn everlasting life. But as uh, many commentators point out, uh, the crowd doesn't get that by labor and work, Jesus is talking about our proper pursuit. You know, we, 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 the regular work we do, we do for a reason. We do it to get food. We do it to provide for our family. It's, it's good and proper for us to do those things. Jesus is also speaking of our proper pursuit, and he makes this even clearer in verse 29 when Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. That's big. That's huge. So it's not work. It's not checking boxes. It's believing in Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do, which in that case, he actually has already done the work. We just have to trust in him to apply it to our account. And so you can't work your way to heaven. That's what Jesus is saying here. Instead, you must trust in the person and work of Jesus to get you there. It's so important. You know, I saw an interview with uh, Dennis Prager Recently, Some of you might be familiar with him. Maybe some of you are not. But uh, Dennis Prager is a, a very po uh, popular uh, conservative commentator. Uh, he, he's also Jewish. And uh, because he's Jewish, he recently said that he is probably one of the most prayed for men in the United States of America because he has a lot of Christian friends and a lot of Christian supporters who pray that he becomes a Christian. Yeah. And Dennis Prager isn't offended by those prayers. He's actually flattered by them. But although Dennis is not a Christian, he admires Christians for uh, doing more to spread wisdom from the law of Moses than he says the Jews have done. At the same time, Dennis Prager also made it very clear in a recent interview that there's two big things, two big issues that keep him from becoming a Christian. And both of them appeared in the text we just looked at. The first thing that Dennis Prager has not been able to accept yet is the concept of someone else dying for his sins. That's the first thing he stumbles over. Dennis thinks he needs to get what he deserves. And he thinks that he has to work his way to heaven. That's what he thinks. And he thinks that his good deeds have to outweigh his bad deeds. Ironically, the law of Moses, which Dennis Prager appreciates so much, tells him this is impossible. It does. And if you don't believe me, if he doesn't believe me, look at Deuteronomy 27, 26. Deuteronomy 27, 26 says, Cursed be anyone who does not uphold the words of this law by observing them and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who does not uphold the words of this law. That's, That's kind of important because what does that tell us? That tells us that keeping the law doesn't earn you any points if breaking it curses you. It doesn't. That's what Deuteronomy says. The part of the Bible he does believe in. Uh, that's what it says. And, and by the way, he and really no one else should find this surprising because any just legal system will tell you that this is true. 
I've used this analogy many times before, and I got it from someone else, so it's not original to me. I think I heard it from Ray Comfort first. But stopping at a red light a million times doesn't make up for the one time you ran it. Doesn't. Uh, uh, restitution must be made instead. Okay, it's not just it's not good enough that you go another million more times stopping at the red light when you ran it that one time. You got to make restitution. Now, in the Old Testament. This was done through sacrifices. But those sacrifices only offered temporary restitution, temporary atonement. They had to be repeated as sins were repeated. And to make matters worse, over time, the sacrifices themselves became meaningless because many who offered them were like, you know, yeah, I screwed up. I did this thing I shouldn't have done. But you know what? I'm going to keep doing it because sin is fun, you know. So I'm going to keep doing it. I'm not really sorry, but here's a sacrifice, and I'm going to do it again. And I'll offer another sacrifice tomorrow. And then I'll do it again and offer another sacrifice the next day. That's what happened in the Old Testament. No one was actually intending to turn from their evil ways. And so something or someone else was needed. Someone or something else infinitely better. And the Old Testament talks about this too. Let me read to you Isaiah 52 13 through 53 12. Behold my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you so his visage the way he looked was marred more than any other man, and his form more than the sons of men. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness that when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And he put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, he, because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah is telling us that there is a better way. Indeed, there is only one way Amen. for you and I to overcome our sins, and that's Jesus. Because this passage could only be talking about. You can't trust your own works to get to heaven. You have to trust in the perfect person and work of Jesus Christ. But this takes us to the second reason why Dennis Prager hasn't become a Christian 
yet. He rightly understands, as we have seen in our study in the Gospel of John so far, that Jesus is claiming to be God. He sees it, just as we do, right here. And I appreciate the fact that he sees it and recognizes it, but in, in his mind, that's a bridge too far. For Jesus to claim to be God, he's like, oh, I can't go there. But is that a bridge too far? Again, let's look to the Old Testament that he believes in. David says in Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The prophet Daniel adds in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. These prophecies about the Messiah are too lofty for an ordinary man. Way too lofty. But it does fit a God man, and that's who Jesus is. <coughs> fully God and fully man. Truly God and truly man. And so we continue to pray, not just for Dennis Prager or Ben Shapiro, but for all to trust in Jesus the Son of God and Son of Man for the forgiveness of sins and everlasting life because only He can give it to us.